Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. We thank you for being here. We greatly appreciate it. We are in Isaiah chapter 9. If you open your Bibles there, please. Before we get started, just a great thank you for all the prayers on my behalf. It is good to be here. We begin in the State of the Union with Isaiah's statement in Isaiah 53.10. I titled it, The Anointed, Anointed with the Oil of Gladness. Now, how in the world can you define the oil of gladness while thinking of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? Who was always anointed with oil? The king and the priests. Those that were chosen by God for a specific purpose. Why is it an oil of gladness? Yeah, the gladness. Yes, Anne. Absolutely. The joy of the gladness, of course, is in the fact that Jesus Christ will save the world. He will save us from our sins. He will carry out God's plan. He will do what His Father needs done. He will accomplish everything that his father has asked him to accomplish. But the Lord, Jehovah here, plural, meaning the Godhead, was pleased according to his will or their will to crush him, Jesus, putting him to grief in the flesh, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Was there a condition for salvation? Yeah. Yeah. We needed a perfect sacrifice. We needed an absolutely perfect, innocent, blood sacrifice so that we might be forgiven. Jesus Christ was that sacrifice. If he will render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Who are Jesus' offspring? Yeah, raise your hand because you are it. You are Jesus' offspring. He will prolong his days into eternity as king. And the good pleasure of the Lord, the Godhead, will prosper in His hand. Does He win or fail? He wins. He wins the greatest victory that's ever been seen on the face of the earth. As we came back, as we come back, as we have missed a couple of weeks, I decided to do a quick review of some of the messianic things that Isaiah has already announced. Now, how many years is, is this before Christ comes? Over 700 years before Christ comes, God is announcing to the world through Isaiah who Jesus will be and what he will accomplish and how it will happen. How is that possible? God. That's a good three-letter answer. God. Despite his discipline, God's discipline against Israel, there, are, there was always hope in the world to come. And he always repeated it over and over and over again in various different ways so that they would understand that God didn't mean them harm, but what? Good. He meant, he meant healing for them. He wanted them to have his blessing. In one nine it says, Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, the remnant... We would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. Is that a good thing? It's not a good thing, is it? Come now, 118. Come now and let us reason together, Isaiah says to the Lord. Though your sins were as scarlet, what's going to happen? They will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool, which is white. All right? Clean, pure, clear again. 127, Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. Who's going to accomplish justice and righteousness for Zion? Jesus in the world to come. 2-2, two, two. now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains and will be raised above all the hills and all the nations will stream to it. When does this happen? Begins on the day of Pentecost. On the day that Jesus establishes his kingdom for two. In that day, the branch. Who's the branch? 
Jesus of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Who are the survivors of Israel? We are. We are spiritual Israel. We are the people. We are the offspring. We are what Jesus accomplishes. We are what God had in mind. Uh, 6 1, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. John says, Who is the Lord here? Adonai? It is Jesus. He saw Jesus sitting in heaven on his throne, lofty and exalted. And what about his robe? The train of his robe filling the temple of heaven. 6.13, the holy city is the stump. The holy seed, excuse me, is the stump. What's the stump? Israel. What will grow out of the stump after it's cut down in discipline? The world to come. The kingdom through Jesus the Christ. Finally, in 8.10, devise a plan. But, I, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Why wouldn't men's plans and proposals stand? Because God had one. And who is always stands? God's does. And so if God had a plan, it doesn't matter what men think they can do. It doesn't matter what men try to do. God will accomplish what God will accomplish. So as we begin chapter 9, I need a couple of people to pass these out. Who's available? Kevin? And Tim. All right. One take one side, one the other. They are collated, so you should be able to pull them right off the stack. <coughs> they're, they're stacked so that there's several pages for each. Ah. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. So in this chapter, we continue on, of course, with the messianic message of the world to come. And we have in this chapter some specifics of who Jesus will be, of what Jesus will be and how he will be, and what, is it, what he is about. As we begin, there is fruit from his discipline, what is fruit and how does discipline apply? Okay. And? All right. Fruit is the result of what is happening. God is sending discipline and he expects it to cause something to happen. He expects them to react to it in a certain way. And can you react in various different ways to discipline? Yes, you can. You can let discipline help, or you can let discipline destroy you, one way or the other. If you decide that discipline is not for you and you go your own way, is it producing the fruit that God wants it to produce? Of course not. And so as God gives Israel its discipline, he's doing this so that what? So that he might help them. So that he might save them. Gentlemen, please don't look at the numbers on the pages. I had to redo them. They should have been stacked exactly as they were given out. One yes, one set. Yes. Yes, Brad. Yeah, amen. amen. Yes. I just finished the teaching this school year, and one boy came in the very last day, failing the class. Yes. What can I do? I go, well, we're out of time. Yes. Back a month ago, if you had come in mm -hmm. when you saw your grade, <laughs> we could have done something about it. Yes. Yep. All right. So it's the reactions. It is the reaction on how God wants to get a reaction to his discipline. Okay, so God is about grace, mercy, and love. So is he looking for the defiant, or is he looking for the humble? He's looking for the humility of the heart, is he not? He's trying to get them to understand they're in trouble, and he wants to help. 
So as we begin in 9 verse 1, but there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. Who is in anguish here? Israel is in anguish. And why are they in anguish? Because they've sinned, they're refusing to repent, and God is disciplining them so that they might come back to him. All right? In the earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Who is Zebulun and Naphtali? Okay, they're two of the sons of Israel, and they were two of the tribes that had land in Canaan, did they not? And he's saying that these two tribes, we'll get to them in a map in a minute, but these two tribes and where they're located, God at one time treated them with contempt. Now, why would God treat anybody with contempt? They weren't being obedient. They weren't following God. They weren't doing the things of God. They'd sinned. And so, therefore, God needed to discipline them. He treated them, but later on, he shall make it glorious. Make what glorious? Zebulon and Naphtali. Those two territories that he treated with contempt. Now, how does he do that? What is he talking about? Nazareth? Did you say Nazareth? Did you say the city of Nazareth? Did you say? You're yeah, very good. <laughs> Where did Jesus spend most of his time on the face of the earth? And Zebulun and Naphtali. Was he a great blessing to that territory? Did he, was he, did he spend his childhood there? Did he spend his time preaching and teaching there? Did he walk around the Sea of Galilee constantly? Did he go further north? These are the things that Isaiah is saying 700 years before Jesus is ever born. Isaiah is telling them, here's the land he's going to live in. Here's the greatness that is going to come to that land, even though I had them in contempt at one time. And we need to understand where and how these people will be blessed by the walking feet of the light of Jesus the Christ, his teaching, his presence, his influence, his healing, all the things that took place. These two tribes, Naphtali and Zebulon, Zep Zebulon, were around the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Jesus spent most of his traveling time, most of his time on the face of the earth. So he goes on to give details about this. He says, first, by the way of the sea, and second, by the other side of the Jordan. And third, Galilee of the Gentiles. Let's back up again. By the way of the sea. What sea? Sea of Galilee. What was the second one? On the other side of the Jordan. Do you remember Jesus spending any time on the other side of the Jordan? He went over here several times to do what? To get, away. to get away from the people and to pray. To spend the entire night in prayer to his father. And the final one was what? Galilee of the Gentiles. The Samaritan area. The area where the Sea of Galilee was. Why did Jesus spend so much time not in Jerusalem? Wasn't his time that they would kill him? Sure, that played a part in it. He even told his brothers and his disciples, you know, I can't go there right now, or we're not going to do this right now because of that. But what else? They certainly wouldn't accept him. Did he pick his 12 apostles from Jerusalem? Did he go to the council and, and begin to interview people out of the council for his apostles? Why didn't he do any of that? They wouldn't accept him. Yeah. Absolutely. Zebulun and Naphtali, people of contempt at one time, they will be lovers of the Lord. 
They will love the Lord to the point where He will choose out of them the very people that will cause the kingdom of heaven to be established, to grow, to spread throughout the entire world. How can Isaiah say these things 700 years before they happen? God. Three-letter word. God. This is what this book is about. This is what we find out from this book. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Did they? Did they around see a Galilee? Did they in Nazareth? Did they throughout the Tyre, Sidon, and the, uh, the area of the Mount uh, Horeb? Horeb? No, no. Eber. One of those mountains. I'll remember it in a minute. Did they not see a great light? Who was the great light? Yes, Anne? Galilee of the Gentiles would have been any area that would have been north of right here. So this was Galilee, but who was in Galilee? We've talked about it a hundred times. You've made a point of it. These two Roman cities are both. Yes. Yes. And the Samaritans. Where did the Samaritans come from? Not from the Jews. They came from other places in the country far, far near Assyria. Assyria said when they replaced them, when they took them into captivity. Absolutely. We're headed towards a place that I'm not going to get for a couple of minutes, but I'll give you a hint. The Hebrew writer says something about the camp. What did he say about the camp? He said to go outside the camp. Jesus was crucified outside the camp. Why do you have to go outside the camp at this particular time? The scapegoat would have been sent outside the camp as a type and shadow, absolutely. But the camp was also what? It was not holy anymore. It was unholy. What was unholy and what was the camp and the type and shadow he's talking about? Jerusalem, the great city that God had placed his name, was one of the most unholy places you could think about, that you could have in that area. And Jesus Christ would spend time there out of necessity, but he would end up being crucified outside the camp because the camp was unholy. The camp was contaminated. The camp was ugly. Brad? The greatest faith in all Israel was the Gentiles. That's Jesus' town. Yes. And he's bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, is he not? In his own time. It doesn't happen immediately overnight. But Jesus does preach to the Gentiles. He even has a lady who says she wants the crumbs, like the dogs from him. Because of why? She wants her daughter healed. She wants to have the blessings of Jesus Christ that she understands only he can give. This is what, keep going back to this, this is what happened in this area when the great light spent all of its time here. And even though this was the place where all the people thought the most religious and holy people resided, and this was the place that Jesus needed to be, and this was where the Messiah would spend his time Jesus was there, and he was there because he had receptive hearts and minds. Where does Jesus go in the world? To people with humble, receptive hearts and minds. That's where he goes. That's where he wants to be, and that's where he will stay. Yes, Brian. He went where there was darkness. Absolutely. He repelled the darkness as the great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Zebulun and Nephtali, yes. Sinners, yes. Did he eat with sinners? Yes. Why does your master eat with sinners, they kept asking. Who were ask, who's asking this question? The Jewish leadership, the unholy righteous, I guess is the best way to describe them. They thought they were righteous, but they weren't. They were unholy. 
You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase, increase their gladness. I put Psalms 23 there. You can read it on your own. I see in that psalm what Jesus is doing in this territory. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, the blessings of God that feeds them. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, the victory of war that they have through their mighty victor. For you shall break the yoke of their burden. What is their burden? What is our burden? What is all man's burden? Sin. He's going to break the yoke of sin. He's going to be the great light. That even though God showed contempt to Naphtali and Zeppelin at one time, He will give them the greatest blessing that ever existed, and that's the walking of the feet of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, God Himself in their territory, in their land. And the staff on their shoulders. What's the staff on their shoulders? It's oppression. Who's the greatest oppressor? Satan. Satan is the great oppressor. He's the one that uses the staff against us. Now a staff can be good because a staff can belong to a good shepherd. But what if the staff is in the hands of the unrighteous or the righteous unholy? What if the staff is in the hands of the Jews of Jerusalem? Is it being used properly? Is it for good? Yes, Brad. Well, that that was a perfect point out there. Satan is the great accuser. Yes. Anybody that claimed to be righteous, he could still hold over them. No, you got sent. Yes. Absolutely. Sometimes I wonder if we see Satan for who he really is. And I want to say that because I want us to grasp he's not alone and he's never alone. He always gets help. If you go to the Revelation, who is the great helper of the dragon, Satan? The beast. The beast Rome. The beast, the great Roman Empire that will do his bidding. But does Satan have others that do his bidding? When when Satan in Luke chapter 4 began to tempt Jesus, did he have any chance? He didn't have a chance. And he found that very quickly. He used the three lusts of the flesh and he went after Jesus and Jesus repelled him with the word of God. Did he give up totally though? Why didn't he give up? Because he had other things in his bag that he wanted to use. And who did he use? Well, he used one man. We call him Judas. And then he used a whole bunch of men. We call them the leadership of the Jews. And then he used a Roman governor, whom we call Pilate. And he used a Jewish king we call Herod. Yes, he used Peter, he used Peter at times. He uses his own disciples. Yes. Satan uses people. Not only against us, but sometimes he uses us as we lose our way and fall to the things that he puts in front of us and gets us to do to others. Satan should not be underestimated. Let's move along. All right. The rod of the oppressor, and then at the end of this statement, he says, as at the battle of Midian. Huh? What's the battle of Midian? You see, if you were a Jew, you would have some of these things in your memory, and they would immediately pop up, and you would remember what your mother and your father told you about them, what you heard in the synagogue about them, what you knew about all the stories of them, and these things would immediately mean something to you. Does it mean anything to you, the Battle of Midian? Yes, Brad, first, and then like, uh, Okay, yes, it would be like that. Absolutely, good example. Our 9-11. These are things that are fresh in our mind, that we would have an absolute understanding. Ian, you had something. Absolutely. There are twice 
that they would have had a good understanding of remembrance of the battle against the Midianites. The first one would have been when they were trying to enter the land of Canaan. And they went up against the Midianites. And who was out there that Satan was using to try to get them to fall? Balaam. Who was Balaam? Prophet of God. Satan can use a prophet of God? Are you kidding me? No, we're not kidding you, are we? Balaam, who could not say while he was prophesying for God anything but what God told him to say, and even though he went home and tried to stay there, he couldn't stand it. He wanted the riches. He needed the power. He wanted everything he could get out of it. He came back, and he told the Midianite and Ammonite kings how to destroy Israel through the sin of the women of Baal. Phineas, remember Phineas? What did he go do? I suppose we're all adults here. Well, a Israelite man, man and the others were lined up having sexual intercourse with a prostitute of Baal the women of Baal, a Midianite prostitute. He grabbed a spear, he walked into the tent, and he drove it through both of them. Was it serious to God? Phineas was a priest. A priest who was serious about sin. Who was serious about saving his people. <coughs> who was serious about stopping Satan. Who was serious? Unfortunately, Sometimes, we not only participate in sin, we just aren't serious about it. Even when others are doing it, we're not serious about it. All three of these are a trinity, a whole of what God wanted them to understand, both of Peor and also of Gideon. What did he do with Gideon? I have these, by the way. In Numbers 31, here's the revenge of Peor we just talked about. We're not going to spend time in it. But the next one, of course, is Gideon in the 300. What did God do with Gideon? Gideon was what? A judge. And we're going to talk more about him tonight, by the way. But Gideon was a judge. And as a judge, God wanted him to fix it. God wanted him to go back to Israel or go out to Israel and defend his people. And who was he defending him against? The oppression of the Midianites. And so God had three different tribes send thousands of soldiers to come and fight against the Midianites. God must have been extremely proud. Was he? Did he use all of them? Sent them down to the river and the unique ones that did not lap like a dog, but pulled the water up with her hand and kept alert, ready for battle? How many of them were there? Just 300 against thousands. What are the odds? Those good odds or bad odds? Would Eisenhower or MacArthur take those odds when he was going against their enemy? They, they wouldn't have liked those odds, would they? No general liked those odds. What, had, what did Gideon have to have? What did the 300 have to have? An overwhelming belief and trust that God was going to do this through them. That's what faith is. That's what it's about. That's what he wants them to remember about the Midianites. He wants them to think about what God can do for them if he will let them. If they will let him, excuse me. If they will let him. Here's the verse I wanted to get to. Here's the ministry of Jesus that brought the light to the world of Nephtali and uh, Zebulun. The shining light came among them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle those of the old law, as a shadow, have no right to eat. What's that altar? Sacrifice of Jesus the Christ. We 
have an altar, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, in which those of the old law have no right to eat because it's past, it's gone, it's ended. And the new sacrifice now is Jesus the Christ. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. The sin offering was a unique offering in that the priest took a certain amount of the animal and he used the blood and then the rest of the animal went where? It went outside the camp to be burned because it was contaminated. It was sin. All right, so what has that got to do with how Jesus was crucified and how Jesus lived on the face of the earth and where he lived on the face of the earth? It has everything to do with the understanding that man, men, had contaminated the holy city where God had placed his name. And they were even going to kill the Son of God. And therefore God would have it done outside the camp in a type and shadow of how he sent the animal sacrifice for sin to be burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, as our sin offering, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, the sacrifice, suffered outside the camp for our sins. As a type and shadow. These things were established all the way back to Moses, 1,200 years before Jesus came. How can that possibly happen? G-O-D. God. God does these things. He does them for us so that we might know. So let us go out to him, out of this realm, outside the camp of the law of sin and death, bearing the reproach in the flesh to receive the Spirit. For here in this world we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. What is the contaminated camp that we are to go outside of? The world sin. This world. Give it up and don't look back. Who looked back? Yes. And what happened to her? Pillar of salt. She became part of this world. This world is not our home. This world we need to give up. This world is the camp. Are we willing to go outside the camp? Jesus was willing to be sacrificed outside the camp. Jesus spent his time on the earth outside the camp. All of these things are types and shadows of the things that we need to understand. Again, a map of where Jesus spent his time on the face of the earth, the majority of his time. Yes, he did go to Jerusalem. He always went for the feasts. He went for that final death, for that final sacrifice, for that final week. But he was killed outside the camp. To the Jews, it was meant to be something that was humiliating. To us, it's meant to be something that's full of humility. Of humility for us, for our own, for who we are. Questions or comments down to that before we move on to verse 5. Yes, Brad. Amen. I mean, Abraham would not give, take anything from the kings when he, when he won the battle except to give the tithe to Melchizedek because he didn't want they or them to say, we made Abraham. Amen. Yes. Gideon, only God had to give him 300 men because yes. it wasn't going to be by strength of physical arms. It was going to be God's power that he won that battle. Every time, it's always only God's power is going to do it. Absolutely. Yes, Jeff. Could you make a, uh, give an example or an application of that last point, how we can do that? Like, what does that mean to us when you talk about outside the camp and we need to learn from Christ's example? What is that for us today? What does that mean? It's so many different things. First and foremost, we have to be willing to understand that we are not of this city, this country, this world. We must have a, an understanding that our citizenship is not here, but it's in heaven. 
And so, therefore, there's so many ways we cannot participate in this world. And I've failed a lot in this sometimes, especially in the po political arena, because we live in a country that allows us to participate. So we think we have to participate. We get involved. We, we get so involved, we sometimes don't realize who we really are anymore. And then we start to realize, through the corruption of this world, i got to get back. This is destroying me. I can't stand it anymore. These kind of things, I think, teach us great lessons. But as Brad was talking about, God does things in his time according to his will that man cannot accomplish. And so if we recognize that, we will want to escape the sin of this world. We will want to escape the participation that others are trying to draw us into in this world. And we will... We will not be like the Jews. We're not going to be able to separate ourselves. The Apostle Paul made it clear. I didn't tell you to go out of the world. I told you to send this man out of your midst. His whole point was we can't take ourselves out of the world. We are the influence, the light, and the salt of the world. We need to be in the world doing that. But when we start to think of ourselves as still being in the camp ourselves and participating in the camp ourselves, then we are becoming more like the world. What happened to Israel when it let the nations around it influence it? Jeff, go ahead. I was curious what your example was. I had some that was similar to that. I think you make an application and here and here out with that. It was interesting because I also looked at it as a triangle in life where you kind of go to work and go home and go to church. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that if we don't get outside of that triangle sometimes and type in, yes. who are we being? And we talk about, I, I don't like the phrase when we say we're not in the world out there. Mm -hmm. The world's in here. Yes. There's sin. Yes. We fail. Yes. So we're not of this world, but we're in this world. Correct. So Amen. I think sometimes we, we have to look at it from that perspective. Yes. Yes. Here, yes. What does our triangle look like? Yes. What are we doing outside of that repetitious act? Sure. Such as the disciples in the example. Yes, yes. Steve first and then Brad. Back in Hebrews, uh, where the Lord first came yes. to fifth, and I think he answered that in a general way. I've read before that. But we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. That's what Israel kept doing. Absolutely. They idols, they acknowledge Baal and others. Yes. We, no matter where we're at, yes. acknowledge his name in everything we do. Yes. And we bring a lot of calmness to us and hate and those kind of things. But that's yes. what he said. Hate that's right. the stuff I do. Yes, absolutely. Brad. Jesus himself in his, the, the last prayer, which is, well, not the last prayer, but the, the prayer in the upper room with the disciples, talks about this as he says, the, the world's going to hate them. I do not ask I am not the world, just as they are not the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Thy word is truth. So how do we get out of the camp is through the truth of God's word. Sanctification, yes. We're put into the bubble of Jesus Christ, into the church into our understanding that we are saved and we have a salvation and we're in that salvation and we can't step out of that salvation. We can't afford to step out of that salvation. It is in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ and we need to hold fast to that in every way possible. All right, any other statement, comments? Thank you very much. Verse 5. Remember, there is a king to come. Now, why is he trying to get them to remember something? Why is he trying to convince them of something? They have forgotten. They have forgotten who, who God is. They have forgotten how to serve God. They have forgotten all these things that God wants them to be. But they're also about to be put under the thumb of the discipline of God. And is it going to be pleasant?
I don't know if, you, if we can imagine how unpleasant it would be when you have an army surrounding your city and they, then they march in and they take your entire family and some of them they kill, but majority of them they, they uh, line up and they put, literally, they put a fish hook through the nose of each one of you, tied to the one in front of you. And they march you thousands of miles to another country to live, to serve, to be servants. What are you supposed to remember as all that's going on? I guess you have to try. God loves you. And he's trying to bring you back. And there's a world to come that will be better. And they wouldn't see it in the flesh, but they will see it in spirit. The ones that were faithful. The ones that were willing to listen. Okay, verse 5. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. Does that sound pleasant? No. Who's going to do this? God is. And he's going to use Assyria for Israel. And he's going to use Babylon for Judah. Yes. But guess what's coming? Why is the scriptures and God, why does he use a child, a son, as hope? Are we out of time? No, three minutes. Why does he use a child as hope? Innocent, Innocent pure, and a future. Yes, a future. Absolutely, a child represents a future. When you talked about God doing things in the impossible. Why did he wait so long to give Sarah and Abraham a son? So they would know. It was by his power. Why did uh, John the Baptist, why did he have uh, Elizabeth barren until John the Baptist was born? So they might know it's by God's power. Why did he have the Son of God born by a virgin or to a virgin? Because he would be the Son of God by his power. All of these things that God brings to a crescendo of it can only happen by God. He's trying to show man the importance of having God, of knowing God, of keeping God, of not giving up God. And he's doing the same thing with Israel. He's trying to get them to understand that he has hope for them down the line. But for now, what's it going to be? Discipline of sin. Discipline for sin. Discipline of the nations. How long is 70 years? Yeah, yeah, it's two generations almost, isn't it? 70 years before they get to come back and have their land back again. Is that a long time? Is that a long time to God? Not at all, is it? To man, it's forever. To God, it's nothing. And God will use it to bring man back to him. We're out of time. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <coughs> yes. On your map, you have Decapolis. Yes. My next sermon's on the Garrison Demonic. Oh, okay, yes. And I was looking for a map uh, to show where he went and, and taught everything. Uh huh. And some of the maps are like yours. That one. And have Decapolis down here. Yes. But some maps go.